Hey everyone, Sir Terma here again, and we're just about a week and a couple days left of this season before it finishes, and if you're stuck in silver, gold, platinum, diamond, then today's video is meant for you. Today I'm gonna kinda showcase four decks that I think are very good to climb with in rank right now if you're looking to kinda finish up your season and make the last push for the next round tier. Now these four decks have had, all of them have like over 55% win rate over the past few days in master and platinum ladder so they are very good at the moment so you can give any of this a shot and probably have find some success to take it to the next level so i'm gonna jump right ahead and the four decks are gonna be bane kane leona diana with shadow isles jens lulu with bandle city obviously and then red gwen with katarina now these four decks you might have seen some of them already been showcasing my channel i think i showcased all of them except for the lulu jens bandle city deck although they can have showcased that one as well. But anyways, the point is that you already have all the videos as well, which I write those resources below. I put my own videos, any other guides that I find, any other videos from other players, so you can check those out as well. And just pick one of these decks to actually be able to come with. But let's go ahead and start right over with the uh, Kane Bane. I'll do a quick breakdown of it and we'll jump straight to the games. And as always, if you like our content, make sure to like the video below and subscribe to us. We post a lot of videos every single day. I'll see you throughout the rest of the video as we just break down each deck one at a time and give you a couple games for you all to kind of check out. Enjoy the games. So to start out with, we're going to be starting with Bane Can. You have already seen me talk about this deck before. It's very powerful. I think it's, my, in my opinion, the best Bane deck in the current meta uh, because it does really well into like Bane Queen or other Bane variants because we have access to Unforgiving Cold, we have access, we can, we, we usually play stuff every post, we have a little bit more strikes than what the decks are able to. And additionally, you have things like your Elusive, your Blooming Cultist, that can push a lot of damage that the opponent has to be careful of. So this deck is as mid-range as it gets. You really just try to win the game between Bane and Kane, uh, trying to get your champions to stabilize, trying to level them up, get a lot of value from the uh, from the tumbles, obviously, especially once you level up the Bane, but also just with the Kane and the fact that you're able to almost guarantee you can get, draw a Kane every game because of the cultists that you have available, like the Ambitious Cultists, the Blooming Cultists, uh, the Forsaken Bakai, and the Buru Cultists, means that every single game you're going to at least have one champion, even if you get unlucky and don't draw your Bane, or they'll naturally join your first bait. So it adds a lot of consistency to this deck, which is what mid-range decks want to have. They want to have consistency because you're usually playing a lot of units on curve and kind of just kind of putting pressure on the opponent. And uh, Kane lets us do exactly that, together with Bane to allow them to level up. Now, obviously, we could have a couple lucky hits that like we could hit the scout with the combat kick, but the combat kick is mostly there to just give us the equipment that we can potentially transfer over to the blooming cultists it's so it's super surprising just how much damage this little this little flower can put out together with the guru cults as well pushing one damage every single time you attack the opponents always have to be careful about their health being a little bit too low and what i also like about this deck is just how much reactivity we have between single combat concerted strike and we talked about the freezes etc Overall, it's a well-balanced deck that does really well against mostly everything in the meta right now. I can I can do well even against some aggro decks. Uh, it does struggle, you know, it does struggle a little bit against like Pantheon decks, especially Pantheon Barrows or Pantheon Bane, because those Demacia decks can go bigger than what this deck can do, and they also have access to Freeze. And obviously, like every other Demacia deck, it does struggle against like Ash decks, but those decks are not as popular in the meta compared to the things that you want to target with this. So just kind of keep that in mind. But let's jump ahead to some, a few a few games so you're going to know how this deck plays out. And again, if you look below in the description, you find the deck code and also some additional resources to all the videos from other people on how to play this deck. So enjoy the games. In this matchup, we're going to be going against Kendra Biego. I haven't seen a Kendra Biego in a long time. Okay, so this is interesting because I do like the Dark in Asia. I, I love the Concerted Strike, but we do play triple Concerted Strike, so it's probably better to just look for the second Concerted Strike. The Dark in Asia seems so good to pass up on. Um, I don't think we ever keep the comeback. We have so many units, especially so many 4-drops units, that it's not necessary. But I think I like the Dark in Asia just to make sure that we're not accidentally putting ourselves in a spot where we actually don't draw any equipment. 
Now, this is not bad here. We can go Cultists. We can go Dark in Ages. We can go Blooming Cultists as well. Uh, start kind of potentially drawing Arcane here in the next few turns. We'll have access to Mental Service to, keep, uh, to save our unit if we need to. But this will allow me to at least push 4 damage if the opponent doesn't actually have a block. And now, remember, we do want to put a lot of pressure on the opponent. So that's, that's very good for us to do it this way. Unfortunately, we don't have any champions, right? Okay, so I mean, I, I, don't, I don't mind just pushing the one damage. Okay, but it's gonna let us push the four. That's kind of crazy. What I love about this moving cultist is the fact that it has a tune. So we're always able to like have one extra mana for the momentous choice in case that the opponent for some reason has like a, a way to actually kill this cultist. What I don't understand here is why not block this last turn if you were gonna open attack like that this whole time. That seems weird. That seems very weird to me. I feel like the opponent should have just blocked the cult. Because they took an extra, what, three damage or so for no reason? I think I'm going to play the Dark in Ages here. This is going to let us push five more damage. Um, and it's going to be very difficult for the opponent to kind of deal with this. I'm going to attack with the Buru again. Even if he allows the opponent to play their, their Biego here. Because if the opponent plays Biego here... I guess now Biego has five health. I was thinking maybe we like single combat, but whoa. All right, so I'm guessing they have access to the Hydrobind then? Has to be Hydrobind, otherwise, why? We have to just pass. It's possible that the opponent has like double Hydrobind and they look out this counter each one, so each Hydrobind is six. Do I, ha do I have to pass here and just have to burn the mana? Because then we're pushing 8 damage next turn. Now, my only concern is the fact that I'm 1 off, right? I'm 1 off. I'm 1 off. Let's go for it. I think I'm not going to pass. I think I'm going to go ahead and go like this. That way we can actually drop play the cane as well. I feel like if the opponent actually has something that they could play, they shouldn't have done this. Like, they shouldn't have just passed. Okay, so... Question is, do we open or do we just go Kane? I think we just go Kane. The punish with the Kane here is that the opponent has the Hydra Bind, right? So, opponent plays the Hydra Bind, that means they get enough blockers to actually punish the whole attack. So, I think we do just open it. We open. That way, when we, we can play around like a Hydra Bind. Ironically, we, we're we going to be one off lethal, right? I mean, actually, I guess we can play the line them up. Hmm. Because remember, this is dealing one damage every single time. If I buff something else, if I buff something we're meant to show us right now, I'll push two extra damage. And then they line them up with the knocking down will be lethal. And there we go. That's the Hydra Bind that we were talking about. We could also... Because the downside is that we don't have like a single right now, right? So we don't have the single, so it's a little bit unfortunate. We can play for the second cultist. Or we could just go for the cane. Let's go for the second cultist. That's that's a good draw. That's a very good draw. I think we go for it. I think we go for it. Go for the make it rain. Oops, sorry. Go for the make it rain, right? Because this one is hitting two. Then we can go the knock them down and then have access to Cataclysm to finish up the game. Opponent's going to have to have access to a Glimpse. And they're going to be glimpsing their own Hydrovine. The fact that we hit Make It Rain and, and they line them up from this is kind of crazy, to be honest. So, we have one more damage that we can push with the Guru Sentinel. While also killing their Hydra Mine anyway. So, the opponent needs to have access to... Opponent needs to have access here to a Glimpse. I guess a Balfis also does it, right? Yeah, Balfis also does it. But then they still lose their Hydra Bind and they still go down to just one health. We lose our Elusive, which to, to be fair is a little bit annoying, right? To lose our Elusive. 
But because the opponent is probably gonna have a second Hydro Vine here, I don't think they have a way to protect against this last piece of damage. What we can play, we can play the Yoral and make it so that the opponent's spells cost more next turn. And I think that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna play Bakai first. We have a second Cataclysm now, so as long as this Spurus Sentinel stays alive, we should be in a good spot. Uh, the problem with the Cataclysm is that it's kind of awkward, because I feel like the opponent's going to have to sacrifice their units anyways. I still like the Cataclysm. I think I still like the Cataclysm. We can take this damage, no problem. Actually, we can even block it if we wanted to, but... Sure, let's, let's take the damage. We can play Ural. And now next turn, now we have we have it enabled so that the opponent has one less. Uh, the opponent's spells are gonna cost more. So we go like this. I gotta pull here. I guess it doesn't matter because the opponent's always gonna be able to block this one. So I guess we're gonna pull here instead. They're gonna have to have deny for this while still having to find a way to deal with two of the units. So we have three ways that we're presenting Lita right now, and we still have access to momentous choice. The only consideration about pulling the Hydrovine is so that we could keep this cult this uh, Buru cultist alive. But the fact that all of the opponent's spells cost two more right now means that the opponent shouldn't have enough mana to stop to deal with three different ways to present the lead. Uh, opponent just had a very awkward hand, right? They, I, I think them not blocking all the like that first attack that we did was really weird. But it seems like they only had the ways to reduce their Hydrovines and didn't actually have Diego. So GG's. In this matchup, we're going against Feel Their Rush. Now, this matchup is interesting because sometimes you can do really well in this matchup. All the times, it can be really awkward. The Dark in Ages is really good, and so is the Forsaken Bakai. So I'm going to go like this. Ooh, okay. So is this is this Buru Cultist better? I think the Buru Cultist is better because I need to put a lot of pressure on them. My concern here is Quietus. So Quietus becomes a really big deal in terms of destroying this Dark Images, right? But we have to bait out the Quietus right now. So this matchup is weird because the Quietus can completely st stun Wallace. Oh Opponent doesn't have Quietus, so they're gonna take four. They're probably just gonna ramp next turn. Okay, the fact that they don't have the, the fact that they don't have Quietus is actually so big. Like, if they, the fact that they're actually just going to ramp here, I mean, the problem is that if they ramp fast enough, they could just also just win. Uh, so we do have to be a little bit careful about that. I think it's time for the Forsaken Bakai instead of the Blooming Cultus. I think I'm passing. So the opponent, I'm passing here because the opponent has six mana. So they probably, they, they're thinking that they, they want to vengeance the Bane, right? So they, they want to vengeance the Bane, is what I'm predicting. The fact that they're losing 3 mana and we still keep our cultists here in the field, I think it's very good for me. We can go for Sengen Bakai here. We can pick the Dark in Ages, which makes our Bakai even stronger. Opponent's going to Catalyst now, when they could have done it last turn. Wow, so we can go Dark in Ages here. Now this is going to be 7-8. We can play the Blooming Cultist on top of it. Which is going to be 9 now. I mean, sorry, 11 now. And we get the Cane too. I don't see how the opponent beats this. Oh, sorry, 11. Right? 7, 8 plus 3, 11. I don't know why I said 9. I can't do math. And this is all you need, right? In this matchup, this is all you need. Just put this pressure on the opponent. And the opponent will almost not be able to do anything. Now, the downside here is the opponent does have 6 mana. I think I like the Yoral. The Yoral is so good because it makes it so that the opponent doesn't have mana to actually kill this guy. He's going to have to spend Vengeance here, right? So they're going to have to spend Vengeance here, which lets me do this, get rid of their blocker, and they don't have the ramp anymore. And then we just open attack, and we have backup repose. Or do we even need to open attack? Do we even need to open attack? Because if the opponent has like an avalanche, they're not killing these units, right? They could have like harsh winds, which could hit two units. So I think I'm always playing for the Bakai. I like, I don't hate the Cataclysm, to be honest. 
I don't hate the Cataclysm. If the opponent that, yeah, that's the Avalanche, right? So the Avalanche gets rid of my units, quote unquote. And then we just play Kane, and this should still be game. It lets me drag any blocker that the opponent has. And that's it. A heart, a flat, a freeze. Okay. But the opponent still doesn't have access to Ruination, so... I guess they could have access to it that stairs next turn. But as long as we keep the Buru Cultist alive, it should be okay. Because now we have enough mana to... Yeah, so as long as we keep the Buru Cultist alive, this is just game. Because we can go like this. This stays alive. We play the Cataclysm, pushes the last 20 damage, and that's game. So because we knew we were getting the Cataclysm last turn, it made it really easy for us to just finish up this way. Uh, yep, it does one. Boom. I mean, opponent played it as best as they could. We put a lot of aggression early on, and this if that stairs almost, almost won the game. Um, we did get a little bit greedy by summoning the pain. We, well, no, we didn't have lethal. If we, if we, if we didn't, if we, if we didn't summon the cane, and we relied on repose, it still would have been the same result because cane dealt three damage just as much as the repose does. So you had to always read the way that we did it. So GG's. In this matchup, we're gonna go against the mirror. Vane Kane versus Vane Kane. You probably get to run into the mirror a lot because this deck has become very popular. Now, I like the Buru Cultus. I'm wondering if I actually supposed to keep her. I think I'm gonna keep her for now. I wanna try this out. I wanna try this out. We ended up not getting any other equipment. It's gonna be a while. I, I, at least we can block, right? If the opponent decides to trade, we can just block, block. And I think I'm willing to take this block, especially because it's gonna be a while before we set up ours. So we're just taking the trade now. We can play the Cultist and then have the Combat Cook and have the Elusive enable. I mean, sorry, the, the Blooming Cultist and then the Combat Cook. Ah, uh, that's, uh, that's a little unfortunate. So the opponent's version is playing Broadwind, which we don't play. Okay, I think we play I think we play for the Bane. I think we play for the Bane. So I think we absolutely play for... Opponent's actually gonna give me the Broadwind. Okay, I don't think I agree with that. I don't mind taking that trade. Yes, our Bane is not gonna... La it's not gonna die to like... Uh... We're gonna go Comeback Kick. So... On turn four, especially now that we do the single combat, combat kick is the best thing that we can do. The blooming cultist doesn't make sense, and this is not enabled either. So we're gonna go combat cook, giving me access to a potential nice equipment. Uh, it's interesting because I mean the pot of pain is not bad because of the tough. The pot of pain is probably better because of the three health that it's gonna have, right? That extra health might be enough to, to make this worth it. Because it means that my unit is going to be a really big blocker that the opponent has to deal with. Right? So the opponent now has a big blocker that they have to deal with here. Overwhelm. So I'm willing to attack here. I think I'm willing to commit this, this single combat. On the Bane, by the way. I think I'm willing to kill both their units. Yeah, so killing both the units here makes sense. We get to trade both units, and we can always go for the combo next turn while putting the uh, Pot of Pain, because we have enough mana to actually do the Cultist into the Pot of Pain. The Blooming Cultist, sorry. My concern here is their Kane. The child is gone. Right, so opponent goes for Kane here. The opponent's going to be in this position, though, where now I get to do this, and opponent cannot do anything about it. They're gonna take six damage because their cane cannot actually kill this anymore. The only downside is that we won't be able to play the Blooming Cultist, and we're definitely not gonna play it and have the opponent kind of kill us. Um, I'm also kind of willing. Ooh, they're gonna take the trade. They're gonna take the trade. If they take this trade, I don't think they ever win this game. I'm also willing to open attack. Cowards hide, but never escape. You're still gonna lose your cane. Okay, so now I don't even need to open attack. Now I can just go like this. Now we're gonna push 8, 9, and have the tumble to be able to finish up the game with the elusive. Yeah, this is game. 
Opponent just ended it with a super aqua hand. We open attack. Opponent at most. Opponent could have the freeze, right? Opponent could have the freeze. Doesn't have the freeze, so they already go down to three. And my tumble levels up my bane, as well as gets me the last thing that we need. Ooh, that's a little bit unfortunate for the opponent. I guess opponent could have single combat here. If they have it, I'm willing to beat this out because that, that means that they're losing to the cultists. If they don't, I mean, they could have sharps as well, but now my Bane is also leveled up. So no matter what, we're going to get a still a cost tumble. And there you go. That's game. It's just too much pressure, especially once we were able to actually kill the Bane. Uh, and that's why I thought that part of the part of pat the the pat the pot was the better choice over the tough equipment because it will allow me to trade with both the units like we did right there with the single combat. So GG's. So you see how strong Kane Bane feels. Uh, honestly, it, it feels really easy to just play this deck. So it's one of the decks that I definitely recommend, especially at the lower ranks, because it's very easy to kind of pick up this deck, learn how to play it, and kind of apple your opponent. This deck puts a lot of pressure on them. And that's why it's doing as well as it is right now. Just do be careful against some aggressive strategies. It can be a little bit awkward. Be, be carefully rolling against a lot of Pantheon. That's what you want to switch it up. But this is not the only deck that's doing really well right now. Another deck that I recommend is going to be Leona Diana. And this Leona Diana deck is doing really well because it actually does good against the Demacia decks. Like that Kane Ben. Uh, that Kane Ben. And that's because Leona with her stuns can put a lot of stop to the plans that those those decks are trying to do. And this deck still also surprisingly does well against some aggro decks. Uh, just because you're able to just go for like this big heavy board and then drop down the winding light to just push for a lot of damage. It is another mid-range deck, which is a good thing. Uh, but it is a little bit slower than your Kane Bane because this deck is going to be more just board, board, board presence. The big weakness with this deck is that if the opponent has a way to disrupt your Leona, so again, that's why those matchup against control can be a little bit iffy. Like if they're able to just bend your stun Leona right away or deal with your Raboon somewhere or another, then it can be a little bit accurate to kind of keep your board and go for that big combo turn of stunning your opponent's whole board. So just be careful with that. But the deck, it's not that hard to pick up either. It's a lot of mid-range stuff that you're going to do. You're going to be summoning your units on curve for the most part. And then try, especially the Sun Guardian, right? You want to drop the Sun Guardian as early as possible. And just kind of get this guy to be bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually get to your Raboon and your Leona to be able to kind of stun the opponent's whole board. And set up for like a Winding Light, which can, you can bring out as early as turn 6 because the Lunaya does bring her. Uh, eventually, the opponent's going to have to deal with this board. And because your units are all very biffy, it's hard for them to deal with it. And that's how this deck ends up winning a lot of games. But enough of me talking about it. Let's jump right ahead to a few, a couple games and see how they go with this deck. In this match, we're going against oh, Echo Gens. Now, we we don't have necessarily like any hard removal per se for like their champions. But we do have a bunch of stuns, which will put the hamper on their plants. Hmm. I think I keep the dust bringer because I mean the um, the dust pedal could be really good, especially for triggering stuff like the Glen Keeper here. Do I want to push this damage? Let's let's push this damage. Let's kind of put some pressure early on. We are kind of like a mid range deck, right? So we do want to put some pressure so that we can kind of set up for like a lethal with um, the winding light. Now we don't have the winding light in our hand. But there's a good chance that we potentially draw it. Otherwise, we can set up the lethal with like the Raboon into the Leona stuns. Maybe keeping Raboon was a little bit greedy without Leona on our hand. Definitely think it was correct to keep the, the Dust Friend with The other question here is, do we go for the Glen Keeper right now? Do we go for the Glen Keeper now and just push this damage through, right? Because the opponent only really has one blocker. If they don't commit another blocker now, I think it's correct to do that. Oh, they do have another blocker. Okay, that's unfortunate then. Why play the cat after the preparations? That's a that's a misplay from the opponent, unfortunately, for them. Night flowers upon my That's a misplay, right? You always should have played the cat first and then the ancient pro because you just miss a predict where you have gotten that thing. Uh, let's go for it. Let's go for it. Again, let's kind of put pressure on them if we can. 
we get punished here by we do get punished here by a predict into the head side crystal like this when it doesn't get it and again that's because they did miss the predict earlier actually they wouldn't have mana for it anyways because the careful preparation costs two so we can kill one of their units here and then push six damage as well as keep their board relatively clear which is not bad for us um the bad thing is that if the opponent is able to level up Jinx, they will be able to clear both of our dust bringers, which could be problematic. I like keeping the heavens aligned until we have the baboon so that we can get both the nightfall and the daybreak effect out of it and kind of get two cards because our car get, our, our car is kind of small, our hand is kind of small at the moment. So I definitely prefer to get both cards if I can. Sure, let's go like this. But it could have scrying sense, they don't have it. But look how they kept both of those bringers alive. I mean, aside from being just good practice, also kind of tells me that they probably do have the gents. Now, that came from the left, so they're not gonna have a way to get rid of all their stuff. Ooh, okay. Interesting. With the power of time, the possibilities are endless. I, I, I like the Waboon. I like the Waboon next turn. We can play Waboon, we'll have access to a bunch of stuff here. If the opponent decides to attack, we can kill the Chronomancer with Pearl Cascade if we wanted to. And we still also have access to Unspeakable Horror. And there we go. So I'm gonna go like this. I'm gonna go like this, because remember, the dust, the dust pedal now reduces the spell. So I, because I had the 4 mana, I was able to do exactly this way. And now what I can do is that instead of playing Baboon, I can actually just play Leona. Allow me to stun the clock lane. I'm pushing all this damage through. And Leona also has Challenger, which means that if the opponent plays Echo or Jens, we could potentially pull them. The Echo is kind of unfortunate because obviously the Echo will still be leveled up. So I don't think we go for the Echo. So I think now we just have to pass. So I think at this point we just pass because we can try to kill the Echo later on. Be if the opponent didn't have three mana, I will go for that Echo. But because they have exactly three mana, I don't feel like giving them the uh, the block. Right? I'm okay blocking with one of the Dust Bringers because we're gonna have a pretty heavy board of units now. Sure. We're gonna have the Raboon. Opponent literally did this because obviously they want to play around the stun. I think we still go ahead and just play the Raboon, get our get our stun out of the way. The fact that they have the time trick also means it's going to be harder for them to level up the gens. Not a great draw. Not a great draw. I think I like the... I mean, I guess we don't have to do the Heaven Sunline now. We could just do a net stun, right? Yeah, we could do a net stun once the is leveled up. Allow me to stun and more units. The great thing here is that no matter what, the Echo is going to get stunned, right? Yeah, that's why we didn't care about blocking with the Dustbringer, because opponents is always, always, always going to have a way to actually kill my Dustbringers. Um, very likely that they have a way to level up Jets. Now, if they can level up if they can level up Jets right now, that's when it gets a little bit more annoying. Is it Raboon or is it Protector? This is interesting, right? Because the Raboon, I don't think does a lot for us. We could also just go for the Iron Rahorak, but that doesn't really work because the cat it stuns, it stuns. It doesn't really, it doesn't give me the two copies. This buffs up Raboon and Leona. I think I like this. I like this because he makes it. I guess Leona was always gonna be able to kill the gems, right? The extra health of the Leona doesn't hurt. We still get the stun. We can go to Heaven's Align. Because my problem with Baboon is that it uses a lot of our unit mana. So if we get a very expensive Daybreak unit from here, we wouldn't have been able to get it. Uh, unfortunately, I also forgot that we don't really get the stun because the owner wasn't leveled up yet. But it's fine because we still get the stun with the Heaven's Align and then do the same thing anyways. Yeah, I, I did forget that Leona is only when she's leveled up, right? That she stuns. 
Uh, but it's fine because we still have enough value here. Yeah, there we go. Heaven's a lie. We get the clips. Wow, I was worried about not getting a cheap unit, and we still ended up with like a super expensive unit here. I'm always gonna kill this gents. Now, the opponent could have access to the. My concern is that the opponent could have access to the rally right now, right? So let's say that the opponent has access to the rally right now. Mm, no? Okay, so they're digging for it? Do we actually go for this and just... No, because he's not going to give me the copy. What if he's actually... the If we're going to kill this gens... If we're going to kill this gens... What if he's actually the priestess then? That we play for? And just get like a like a, a way to kill it. I still think we go for the whole attack. I, I don't I don't like playing baboon here. I still think we go for the whole attack. I think we go for the whole attack. We go for the whole attack. Opponent could have the rally here, but that's gonna be really using up one of the chrono chrono breaks. And they still don't get to attack with Echo because they could still stun. So the Chrono Break is pretty, it's not that great for them. Even if they have it in their hand already, because the Echo is still stun. I don't care about losing the Dust Bringer. It kind of, because again, we can have a pretty heavy board. We could actually go for the Ira. If they're putting literally summons nothing else. Ah. So that means that they didn't have, they don't have two of them. If they had two of them, they could have done on the Leona. They could have a second gents in their hand right now. Echo. I definitely think it's going to be Lunari. I think it's going to be the Priestess and potentially get something that could get rid of their units. The, pro the problem for the opponent is that they always have to open attack. They always have to open attack and yeah, they do have the second one. They always have to open attack because otherwise they're always getting stunned by Leona. Unfortunately, we don't get anything that gets me pushed that lethal but the destroyer Mind could be decent with the overwhelm the probably was better to go for the draw though if i'm being completely honest we're gonna lose oh doesn't even get to level of gens wow so they have something that costs more than two and we have the winding light we win again next time then right i like going for the second baboon this turn Hmm. Yeah, I like going for the second Raboon this time. Because what we can do... I'm going to force the opponent to commit something to kill this Raboon. This is always going to die anyways. Right? So this one is always going to die anyways to the rocket. If opponent goes for the rally, we're still able to just stun their echo. Have sober, yeah. So they have to commit something here to keep their echo alive, and then we still get to stun it anyways. So we kind of lock down their echo. Like, yeah, you can get the you could get the thing here, but it's not doing a lot. By playing the baboon, we potentially get a cheaper daybreak unit that then we can use. Oh, that's that's not a bad one. The echo still gets stunned, so even if the opponent has the rally, it doesn't matter. The Jinx is only pushing four damage. Uh with the with the um with the rocket, even if the opponent is able to level it up. I'm surprised he didn't commit for the return. What was he scared of? Even if they have a way to bring back their units this turn, I think we win by the way. Wow. Even if they bring back the units, we still have the... Like, this is going to finish the game. Like, th at this point, this game is just kind of... We still have 20 HP. We have a level of Leona. Opponents literally not able to do anything. They did have the rally this whole time. But what is the rally doing for them? What is this rally doing for them? If they attack with the gents, then they probably have a way to ping. Well, not, not even, right? 
They don't have a way, they have to spend the Absorber and need to have one mana, so they don't have a way to actually stop this Leona from just killing the gents if they attack with So... We definitely want to go Winding Light. So we can go Solaris Soldier. Right? We can play Winding Light. Opponent could go for their big Battle uh, Negation. I was debating if it's better to play to do this on the ephemeral and then do Winding Light, but Winding Light is just adding so much to everything if I just do it this way. Sure. That's actually a big hit by that. That's actually a pretty big hit. Yeah, that's actually a pretty big hit. Do we take it? Is there a way that we don't win with Winding Light? Is there a way that we don't win with Winding Light? I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna risk it. That 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 um, I completely forgot about the parallel convergence, right? The parallel convergence could actually win them the game. With the overwhelm, though, I'm having a hard time seeing how I lose this. We can even kill the gents. I guess opponent's gonna have the revive though, so that's gonna be a little bit unfortunate. Because we will be able to bring to buff everything one more time. We will be able to buff everything one more time with the onto dust onto the winding light. There is already four. Opponent's gonna have to have a silence. And the silence doesn't work because we give everything over one again. Because we have everything over one, even if the opponent has a quicksand, it doesn't work, right? So that's why the Unto Dust is so good. Because even if the opponent has quicksand, we get to give everything overwhelm again. Uh get excited. Oh, that sucks. I was gonna play it, but I don't need to anymore. GG's. I'm not gonna risk it if the opponent has something else, so let's just go for it. <laughs> GG's. This match we're gonna against Elise Nora. So they're kinda like a more aggressive style deck. I like Leona, right? Leona is so so good. And Diane is so good at also getting rid of their Nora. I feel like I need something like a Dustbringer to really make this Diana work the deck. So I needed to mulligan the other cards away. Okay, so our hand is a little bit more aqua now than I would like. Hmm, double pill cascade. Not a deal. We could play Diana down right now and just push the damage with her. Right, just push the two damage. We're putting her Quietus though. I forgot about Quietus. That's on me. I forgot about Quietus. I literally, as soon as I dropped it down, as soon as I dropped down the Diana, I was like, wait, what about Quietus? I absolutely had to play around Quartus there. So that's that I, I deserve that. I got greedy there. Uh, just because I played too fast. But it's fine. I think we're still in a decent spot where I'm not too concerned about this. We still have the Leona. We don't have a lot of daybreak units though, so it could be a little bit problematic. Hmm. What do we pass? What do we just pass? The problem is opponent has vengeance, right? Opponent has vengeance or has access to mini more potentially either way. I'm gonna play Leona now. Even if we're using up the barrier. Ah sorry, even if we're using up the stun. And just that the opponent can make their vengeance right now. I think losing I think losing Diana actually is gonna end up being a really big deal. Um so it's a little unfortunate that I messed that up. Opponent has, a, opponent has to have a way to remove this Leona. Doesn't make sense otherwise. Yeah, opponent has to have a way to remove this Leona. Let's go Soldier. Into Blank Keeper. Like this is this is telling me vengeance or many more. But it has to be it has to be vengeance, because if they do the mini morph, then that means that we'll get to do it ahead of time. So I'm wondering now if I should actually pull with the sapling instead. But I don't think that's correct either. Because I mean, we do have the pill cascades to be able to beat this stuff, right? Feel the sun's glory. 
Juan is gonna vengeance here, but they, they have a choice. They can either say they can either save Nora or save Elise. And I actually think that we go like this. I'm forcing to choose to say like I wanna lose I wanna kill this Nora. If the opponent has vengeance, I wanna kill this Nora. So they can vengeance Leona. Which means that the Nora still dies. Or they can try to battle feast this. Which means that we pell cascade. And still kill the Nora. While still also killing Elise. Pokey stick. Okay, you have a third one. Now, if they do have a third one, then that's when I get punished, right? But I think this is correct. Because I think the opponent's playing like they have a vengeance in their hand. Wow, they actually have a third one. Alright. I think it I think it was correct. I, I I will take that every single time. They had to have a very specific set of three cards to actually be able to to stop that from killing them. Ah, for, to be able to save the Nora. And it was better than us losing our Leona to just a single vengeance while they while they still keep their Nora alive. So cool. I mean I'm willing to mm, mm. Okay, they're gonna just try to level up this run. I mean, they're always still gonna potentially die, right? I mean, we're gonna have... We're gonna have a lot of value here. We can play the Baboon. We can play the Baboon here. Go for the Heaven Saline. That way we level up Leona for our, our attack, our, our push next time. Right? So this way Leona is already leveled up. We get the Daybreak and the Nightfall. So we get two cards here. Mm, do I wanna? Do I wanna commit the mana now? I mean, not be, because we have a second Leona. I kind of actually I should probably always keep the second Leona, right? So I'm probably not gonna do it anyways. What I will do is that I will go for the Sunhawk. Woo! That's a level of Nora, right? Yeah, that is gonna be a level of Nora. We can go for Sunhawk, stun their key units here. Opponent could actually not have access to a freaking detain. That's kind of crazy. Yeah, because the pony just needs to summon their Harbinger, get over one of the Spiderlings, and he saves the Nora. However, the opponent also needs to be careful to not just straight up die. And I think they're going to straight up die, right, because they did this. I think we might just straight up kill them, to be honest. We can stun two more. I guess opponent always can just summon the Harbinger, right? So that's not really true either. No, they still need to summon more things. Hmm. They still need to summon more things, yeah, right? Because we can stun two more units. But that's still gonna be... An... Everything gets plus one, plus one. So we go like this. Six, nine, twelve. 15, 18. It's going to be exactly 18, and we get double the stun. Opponent is going to need one more unit. This is stun two more. Imagine if we had one more Daybreak card right here. If we had a cheaper unit, it would be so good. Like, if we had another Daybreak unit here, if we had gotten something cheaper from the instead of the Stellacorn. If the opponent does have the last unit, then... Right, so they just lose. We have the we have the Pelka. I mean, so we have the Speakable Horror. We have the Doombies. All right. Yeah. We did. We did us again. I, I don't think it was a misplay what we did last turn, where we went for the Nora with the uh, with the Ephemeral. Opponent just had the perfect answer for it, but he still kind of took a lot of resources out of them, and opponent just ended up tapping out of mana this turn, which I think was crazy. You should never tap out of mana against Leona in that way, so GG's. So we got to see some of the power there that Leona deck and this, this Leona Diana deck can have, where you can just lock down the opponent. We saw that with the Echo Jinx match, you just lock them down, and they really cannot do anything because they wanna be able to attack, and then you just finish it with a big winding light, or as you saw in the game against Elise Nora, you can just finish the game by just stunning the opponent's whole board between Leona and Raboon, and getting rid of all their blockers and just pushing damage through, right? Either way, it feels very, very powerful and can deal with a lot of the massive decks, a lot of the mid-range decks, and sometimes even steal games against control. 
if you end up building a pretty big board because of how much value the Sun Garden and other cards that that can put out into the field. So this will be the second deck that I recommend if you're looking to climb and make a last minute push this season. The third one is another interesting one. So this is in my opinion, is probably one of the best aggro decks right now. If you're trying to do is just play aggro, kind of play fast. And this is going to be actually Jens Lulu. So Jens Lulu uh, is very, very powerful. You can just, you're able to put in a lot of like cheap units. Obviously the Poro Cannons, the Yuri Rigs, the Sunny Urchin Boom 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 with the Chumpers, the Chumpers themselves, right? Uh, and then kind of buff them a lot with the Bigel Dust to make them even stronger. Or even sometimes buff them with Purple Rubber Shake to just push a lot of damage, right? All these cheap units allow us to be able to have little units in our hand for us to, to level up the gins and if you do want something more powerful you're able to actually play squeaker to be able to get some of the mecha yodos which can allow you to finish up some of the games and surprise the opponent with some of the cards that you can have and obviously you still play lulu for that lulu chumpers combo uh we still have some burn with get excited we still have pokey stick for some draw and rummage so he ends up kind of being one of the best gin stacks out there uh, you can play this deck, you can play other varieties of gins, like like the gins failure that I showcased the other day. But I think this one seems to be performing the best in ladder, seems to be the most consistent if what you're looking for is to win more often than not. Uh, so let me show you how this deck plays out, but it's very aggressive, so it's nothing new that you might not have seen of if you have played any gins in the past before. So enjoy the games. In this match, we're going against Gwen Hecarim Maokai. Uh, this kind of sucks because the opponent's gonna have a life steal, right? So the opponent's gonna have a lot of life steal to actually be able to kind of come back into this. Um, I don't mind the flame chompers. Maybe actually the boom baboon is what we want. Trying to see if I can get my Lulu, right? There we go. That's the Lulu. So now we're looking for Poro cannons, I guess. I'm gonna just push damage this way. I'm just gonna push this three damage here. I have to put a lot of pressure early on. We can go boom ba boom. If we don't get the Poro Cannon, then that's fine. We can also just straight up play the Chompers and then play the Lulu. Depending on what the opponent does here. Might actually be better. Might actually be better. We can just play the Chompers out. Play the Lulu. Okay, 100%. I'm gonna play Chompers, then Lulu. Be able to kill the Soul Shepherd. And take advantage of things this way. It sucks that we didn't have the Poro Cannon. But I don't think I should I don't think I should risk not being able to kill the Soul Shepherd. I, I don't think I, I don't think I ever supposed to risk not joining the Poro Cannon. We got it, but I don't think I'm ever risking that. Yeah, we're just gonna go like this. Even if we lose Lulu, I think that's fine. Yeah, I think that's fine. I think this is more important than losing Lulu. That's gonna just push a ton of damage. We also still push three damage here. And we have a chance of potentially leveling up gems. Probably do want uh, do I wanna play around Black Spear? The rot must huh. away. With one mana, there shouldn't be anything that they have, right? Maybe it was actually better to go Poro Cannons into Bigel Dusk. Yeah, that was probably better. That was probably better. Because we could have gone Flame Chompers, Poro Cannon, Bigel Dusk, boom, boom, boom. Go like that. I kind of like the idea of just pushing six damage here. Maybe even more. Is there any way for me to level up gems this turn? I don't think there is. Why don't we just go like this? Why don't we just go like this? Get the opponent down to 5 health. Before the opponent can summon a sapling. Yep, there we go. Now the opponent is down to 5. And they have to be careful of, of, of the odds that I might have. Yeah, the, the saplings are going to be kind of annoying. Because the opponent will be able to kill gems, by the way. Opponent will be able to kill gens because the saplings is gonna have the buff from the hollow, from the hollow. Um, but at this point, opponent could just straight up die to the elusive or to the rest of my board. So we should be decently okay. I guess opponent could have access to 
Opponent can have access to the Dragon Ambush too, right? Battle Feast, Dragon Ambush. There's a lot of outs here. You're just gonna kill her like this? Alright, we, ne we were never stopping that. I guess opponent decided not to risk... Not to risk me leveling up the gents. Which is completely fair. We hit the wrong unit. We hit the wrong unit. So that feels bad. That feels really bad. If we hit the elusive, we actually have lethal. We will have five. Opponent gets to keep the sapling alive, right? Why not commit another sapling? I guess opponent probably has... It has to be Dragon Ambush. Doesn't make sense. Anything else doesn't make sense. Anything else doesn't make sense. Hmm. We can Poro Poro. Had the Poro Cannon for the Chumpers. Losing that Jens does hurt. They drew the one of Malka to be able to get to that point. Balfis is a problem. Maybe Bigel Dust was better. Maybe we went a little bit too aggressive. Because Bigel Dust would have been better with the Elusive. I mean, but that was that was too juicy. That was way too much damage for me to like pass up on that. Like that was way too much damage for me to pass up on that. The opponent's also kind of playing like a weird list. We can hatch we can pull both blockers away with the second chompers. Okay, so they're digging. They're digging here. We can pull both blockers away with the second chompers and then push seven. The opponent's gonna have to have the battle feast or a vengeance. So we go like this. So opponent's gonna have to have a battle feast or a vengeance. That's a they have a really weird list. My concern, I've gone against this player before. My concern was gonna be the, dra the, the, uh, the Dragon Ambush, right? So the Dragon Ambush was my big concern. I'm gonna go like this so that I can hit the Poros. That's an atrocity out of the way. There's one Dragon Ambush gone. We get to get a little bit of draw. We're not hitting the Poros. That feels bad. Like, that feels... Re That's a second Dragon Ambush and a Battle Feast. We're not hitting the Poros, and that feels really bad. I want to look for Get Excited. And there it is. And now we just rip it. At least the opponent gets to see their Hecarim level up. They lose the Poros. It's a weird game. It's a weird game that we won with our gents. But you see the amount of pressure that the Bigel Dust puts in into the opponent. Uh, I'm kind of... Hmm. What if I actually don't go for the lethal now? What if they have... No, I think I have to go for it, right? The only other they could have here is Nopify, right? So if they have the Nopify, they have it. And even if they have no profile, then they still have to deal with the with, with the double with the double daring poro next turn. And there we go. Like even if they have the no profile, they still have to deal with the double poro the double poros next turn. Uh, I don't want to have to play around a denying next turn, so I have to just go ahead and do it right now. So GG's. In this match, we're going against Rudier Fiora. Funny enough, I think Fiora is probably very good versus herself because she'll be able to just steal like get a lot of value from all the like small units that we have i like keeping the sun urchin let's see if we can find something that we can discard with her Ooh, we get the boom ba boom but we don't get the chumpers so i think we have to just play the boom ba boom by itself and then keep this for the chumpers double get excited is a little bit awkward that is a little bit awkward we can wait to pull that with the chumpers into lulu Hmm. I guess we can go like this now. I definitely want to kill the Starlight Seer. Oh, they have Shatter. They have Shatter, which is fine because we'll get to play the second. Ah. Oh. So that's not a Shatter. 
So we're gonna go like this. I don't care about losing the first Lulu. We have a second one. I don't care about losing the first Lulu. We have a second one. So I think this is fine. I kind of like going for... Hmm. The stance one makes this so that the portal cannons are a little bit awkward. So I think I'm going to go like this. Way too many get excited. Let's just rip the first one. Let's just rip the first one. Be mana efficient. Yeah, this stance one makes me feel very bad. Very sad. Because the ram stance is going to feel really bad. Yeah, there it is. Then young fox, lead us to their heart. Sure. They get to clear my whole board here. Yeah, there it is. Ironically though, I mean they're losing damage to themselves. They get to have another ram stance. They're dealing damage to themselves, so I don't hate it. I wonder if it goes for it one more time. Does he go for it one more time? <laughs> He's just burning himself out. So now we're gonna be at the opponent's gonna be at seven. I guess the opponent could have access to like a troll shan to save their unit. We can go squeaker here. This none of this none of this are good for us. None of this are good for us. Wow. I think I prefer going like this. I think I prefer going like this. It presents another unit that the opponent has to deal with. Wow. So let's say that the opponent has like a troll shan. I think we should absolutely go for this. And kind of threaten the Udyr. Because the opponent is going to have to... Do something to save this Udyr, right? So opponent's gonna have to do something to save this Udyr. The only downside is that we give him the level up. So we give him the level up. Opponent could have harsh winds. This is lethal here because of the impact. Opponent will need to freeze the Crasher. Atrocious is not enough because they still lose to the Get Excited next turn. So they're still losing to the Get Excited next turn. Could be like a single combat, but that's still also... I guess the single combat does stop the damage. As long as I can do 7. So as long as this doesn't get hit, it's okay. Troll Shen still pushes 8. Harshness is the baddest, is the worst thing here. But there's the Troll Shen, and if he also has single combat, then I'm sad. Yeah, so he had both. Yeah, Trojan and single combat is bad. Because now the opponent gets to level up the Udyr and then just push damage that way. I mean, I guess we can... No, because they, they get excited, won't work right away. Hmm. How much does this Udyr go up to? With the Overwhelm. He doesn't take the overwhelm hit? Doesn't take the overwhelm hit. Interesting. Maybe he has the rally? Has to be the rally then, right? Doesn't have the rally either. We have Jens plus get excited to finish up the game next turn. So we play Jens, we get excited, we have three plus four. That's a little bit unfortunate for the opponent. Yeah, I didn't feel like playing Jens last turn. Oh, they're even gonna burn themselves even more. I was gonna say, you're gonna burn yourself even more? Actually, the burning. Ooh, ooh. That's rough. Do I finish with the rocket or do I finish with the attack? 
Do I finish with the rocket or do I finish with the attack? I guess let's finish with the rocket, right? We might as well finish with the rocket. The attack is probably better, right? Just in case that the opponent does have a way to deal with the rocket. But in these regions, they shouldn't have a way to deal with the rocket because it's dealing four. So we ended up getting there by doing our, our Lulu. So GG's. And there you see the power of Jens and just how power, how easily she can just turn our game around. Unfortunately, I didn't get to go against a lot of like super meta decks as I was trying to record against for Jens. But because we have so many other games in this video, I figured it was fine. We just go like that, have some fun, kind of showcases the power of the Lulu plus Chompers combo, the power of Jens coming down and how Squeaker can actually put in a lot of work depending on what you can draw from Squeaker. Again, just kind of put a lot of pressure on your opponent. Uh, sometimes you can win even without champions. You just gotta put a lot of pressure to a point that they're not able to 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 uh, to the, um, to put pressure back on you. Uh, but yeah, so that's kind of how you play this gents Lulu deck, just really aggressive and kind of go from there. The last deck I wanted to showcase for you all is a deck that you all might be familiar with, and that's gonna be Red Gwen with Katarina. Now this deck was the most popular deck. Uh, to make the top cut in the world's regional qualifiers and for good reason this deck kind of has like a very even matchup spread where it doesn't really lose to anything and it has really good matchups against a lot of control decks uh so it ends up being really 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 good and a really good choice especially in a tournament set setting and in a ladder setting uh because the only thing that you really have to worry about is a lot of like the aggro decks uh but for the most part you kind of have good matchups into everything else so almost every matchup you're able to potentially win and come back from it as long as you know how to play the deck. So let me showcase with this with you all. This is the sets and list that I showcased a few days ago, the list that I brought to the original qualifiers. So again, I post the link to that video below in the description as well, and you can check that out now more. But the idea with this deck is that you kind of like a tempo deck, kind of like a mid-range deck. You're putting a lot of pressure with Katarina, with Gwen, with the Fallen Reckoners, and with the Foyers to the point that opponent eventually runs out of blockers. They have really accurate time blocking your units and you can just push that damage that way and then finish up the game. How we on Eternal Dances are more like get out of jail cards, kind of get your wins out of nowhere. But for the most part, you're trying to win the game with your other stuff instead. So yeah, let's let's give this a shot and see how it goes. In this matchup, we're gonna go against Lulu Jens. So the, one of the decks that we're showcasing the video today, we're kind of going against it. This is an amazing hand. The host and the house spiders are very good at, getting re uh, at being able to block the opponent's units. The Gwen lets us kind of heal up. I think I'm actually going to kick away the butler. Hmm. I'm going to kick it with the butler. I'm going to kick it with the butler, try to look for like a, a, a block. Because I'm going to need a way to kill the gems. Or Katarina. Katarina also will help us out a lot to be able to just remove the opponent's units. Regardless, we get to kind of push a lot of damage here early on. Go ahead and kill me. We have the house spider as blockers. Uh, eventually, our Gwen is going to kind of potentially take over. I'm just scared of the Lulu Chumpers combo. The Lulu Chumpers combo is the only thing that really scares me when we play this Gwen out. Okay, we get the flock. We get the flock. So if we can put some damage in the gens, whether through our own battle feast or something else, then now we have a good way to kill the gens. Also have a good way to kill the Lulu because we have, you know, obviously enough attackers for that Lulu. We can attack with the both with both spiders next turn because this one is gonna go up to two because of the halo death that we really have in the graveyard and kind of go from there. Um unfortunately this doesn't really hit a lot of things. Okay, I say that. So opponent's gonna try to push. Ha! Huh. So they're gonna go this way instead. So we can push this damage. Let's just push this damage now. Oh, he's gonna take it. You gotta pass. I'm gonna pass. Because I wanna have access to Quietus to kill their chompers. Right? So we're gonna go Quietus here, just get rid of their chompers before the opponent could have another tiny spear for it. He sucks, because I mean, you know, obviously that, that's a target that we could have blocked. Two damage here doesn't matter to me because we have access to Gwen. There is their second Lulu. Now the question here is, does the opponent have a Chumpers? Like if the opponent has Poro Cannons into a second Chumpers, and they, they, they have exactly that, right? 
So it was kind of obvious what the opponent was setting up for. We're gonna glimpse this now because I feel like I'm gonna need some additional health now. We know that the opponent has another tiny spear or tiny shield in their hand. The damage hurts, but it's not gonna be crazy. We can quite us the chumpers again next turn. Uh, the problem is gonna be the losers now and the damage that the losers can put in. This doesn't really matter. I think we just open attack. Because the opponent can always just block it with the squire. Yeah, I think we just open attack. We're gonna quiet us these chumpers. Opponent only has access to one card left that we have that we don't know about. The Gwen will let us kind of heal back up to two. Unfortunately, we have all these glimpses, all these flocks, sorry, and not really any way to use them. We always gonna quiet us these chumpers, 100%. But it also means that we're going to get hit by a Daring Poro that's going to be buffed up by the Lulu. But the opponent is going to lose the Lulu to the Butler. And we're going to go from there. They have a potential Tiny Spear. So this will be 2 plus another 4 sits plus another 2 here. Yeah, there it is. Oh, actually, yeah, they have another Poro as well. So we're going to take a lot of damage. But because of the Gwen... We might be okay. The only part here that's really unfortunate is the Bigel Dusk. All right, so the opponent has the Bigel Dusk. I think we just straight up lose. But I don't think that I can play around it. I mean, I mean I'm okay with losing this Gwen too, by the way. Because we're going to have the Eternal Dancers to bring her back. Lulu dies. Jota Squad lies. They, they're digging for it. So this is telling me they're digging for the Bigel Dusk. They're digging for the big of those, which is actually pretty it's actually pretty smart. But it also means that they just stepped out of a get excited to be able to do that. So they just stepped out of a get excited to be able to do that. We can play the eternal dancers. Hope that we get something better next turn. We can heal back up by two, so we got a, we go up to seven. Opponent just got rid of a get excited just a second ago. Like, that's a, that's a very aggressive rummage. I respect it. Because, again, if the opponent got the Bigel Dust here, they would have just won on the spot. We don't lose to Jens, even if the opponent has the Jens here, but we will lose the Gwen to the Jens. So while we don't necessarily lose to the Jens directly, losing the Gwen is going to be very annoying. And if the opponent has Jens, then we pretty much just lose the game. Yeah, so if the opponent has Jens, I think we just lose the game. Okay, Lulu? That's not a Jens, but it's still very bad. Still really bad for us. Hmm. I guess what we can do is just put pressure here. Right? We go like this. Opponent doesn't have a lot of fearsome blockers. So they're gonna have to block with their elusives. This is five, eight, ten. Opponent's gonna live at one. Opponent's gonna live at one. And we can glimpse, and if we get Katarina, opponent's in trouble. So if we glimpse and we get Katarina, opponent's in trouble. Huh. We're taking four sits. We get on to one. We get on to one. We glimpse here. Because the other ones get punished by a get excited or a pokey stick. We get the battle fees. Pop this one. We can pop the second battle fees on the Lulu and the Flocker. Opponent might be tempted to like self pokey stick to deny the heal. Okay, we're just gonna flock that, right? Okay, so we're just gonna flock that then. Yeah, we just flock here. If the opponent doesn't open attack, they get punished by a second flock. So now we're just taking four. Now we're just taking four, unless the opponent has gens here. Yeah, we just take four. If the opponent decides to not open attack, we can Balfis and flock the second Poro. 
Alright. Still think we're okay. Jinx is not enough. Jinx is not enough anymore because we have Vile Piece to back it up. We can we should probably Vile Feast flock the Jinx if she comes down. And that's game. I guess we're losing to get it sided plus. We're losing to get it sided plus um get it sided plus mystic, right? Or double get it sided also does it. Opponent maybe this kind of one get excited, so I don't think I'm doing anything about it. With 4 HP, I guess get excited plus Poké Stick doesn't. It has to be exactly double get excited. And if the opponent is playing any list close to my list, then they don't actually play it. I mean, you're losing to the one skill, right? You're losing to the one skill. Now we know that the opponent doesn't have double get excited. Yeah, the slip snip is killing you, my friend. <laughs> Third Lulu. That was their third Lulu, unfortunately, for them. And GG's. Yeah, that glimpse helped out a lot. Opponent ended up not having any way to, to stop my glimpse on the on the uh on the two drop. But we had to play it safe, play around a pokey stick, play around a great side, because I really need to get it. I really need I really needed that joy in my opinion. So GG's. GG's. In this match, we're going against Jens Relia. So it's kind of like a version of gents. We showcased this before where they uh, tried to just get a lot of value from um, the Poros and the Spirits Unleashed. Spirits Unleashed. That's the word that I was missing for. Honestly, this Sentry is not bad. I don't dislike this Sentry. Because I have three flocks in my deck and I'm going to I'm gonna play for that flock draw. So that I can hit that gents. Come on, people. Let's make tomorrow. So I want to be able to hit that Jinx as she comes down. I'm willing to take this. It makes my house spider attack even better now because the opponent just gave me the hollow buff. That's cool. Uh, we can go house spider. We're going to have Gwen. Let us heal back up if we need to. Spirit Unleash is the only way that they really get to push a lot of damage. And if they don't have it, then we're chilling. Let's push four. This way, if the opponent has Mystic Shot, we still get to push two damage instead of then like doing Mystic Shot on the House Spider. We can play Gwen on turn four instead of we don't need to play this out. Then we'll have the Fallen Reckoner. Opponent's gonna play Spirits Unleash and kill this Spiderling. Makes the most sense to me. The only downside, oh, it's just gonna be a Jets. Okay, so this is telling me no Spirits Unleash in the opponent's the uh, opponent's hand. They can play their gins, but what is she going to do? You have a full board. You have a full hand, sorry, not full board. So I don't think you have a way to level up gins anyways. So I don't think the opponent has a way to level up gins. So I think we're just going to be putting too much pressure. Um, we can even go Fallen Reckoner next turn and then set up another great attack and have the Ruin Reckoner to follow up after that. We're going to do the same thing we did earlier where we attack with the Spiderling first. That way, opponent doesn't have any really good blocker against the Spiderling. They already go down to 8 HP. Which means that the Snip Snip is going to start adding up a lot of pressure on them. Unfortunately, we don't have that many Hallow buffs in the graveyard. Right? I really want that Flock, right? Like, the Flock would feel so good. <laughs> flock would feel so good in this scenario. It's such a nice way to be able to kill their gems. Fortunately, we don't have it yet. I'm gonna get the Sun Dredger. Still has a lot of cards for them to make me scared that they're gonna level up the gems. Like, I'm still not really scared of the gems. Uh, maybe it's better to go Ruin Reckoner this time around. Okay, that's the Spirits Unleash. So they finally got it. What we can play now is that we can go Phantom Butler. Yeah, let's go Phantom Butler into House Spider. I don't think the Fallen Reckoner is necessary. Because the opponent can just sacrifice the Chumpers. So I think the Fallen Reckoner goes for later. The opponent can get excited here, kill this Gwen. Okay. And now that they kill this Gwen... Probably shouldn't take that 7 damage. I was debating if I want to give him the easy target with the House Spider. And I think we do, right? He can just pull the Spiderling. 
Doesn't even do that, so I'm just gonna get the trade anyways. Hmm. We go here, get rid of the one health one. We can play Eternal Dancers and just bring back our Gwen. Or we can do Fallen Reckoner, right? We can go Fallen Reckoner, get rid of the blocker, and just attack with this guy who's gonna have Overwhelm. The opponent has a Jens, yeah, big Wook. Next turn, we're gonna have Wind Reckoner into Fallen into Risen Reckoner to finish up the game. So we're still in a really good spot here. We have exactly seven mana to do both and still have access to battle piece. You get you don't even get to level up gents this turn. I can block the gents with the house fighter. I can battle piece the scutter. And we're still okay. Do I battle piece the scutter now? So opponent could technically have access to like uh it's probably better to actually go eternal dancers, right? Because I technically I get excited. Technically technically I get excited could be problematic. So like if we go eternal dancers. If we go Eternal Dancer, so opponent really has no way to kill this this guys, and then I just summon the Gwen. I mean, sorry, I'm gonna summon a second Risen Reckoner. We could also play Katarina, and we can also go back with the Wound Reckoner. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah, there we go. They get the rocket. They got rid of the Get Excited to be able to get to this point. What if? So they play next turn. Ah, no, they have too many cards. I was thinking maybe they play next and it's actually... Because I'm trying to think what, what the most efficient way to do this. Because this is going to bring back the Reckoner, not the... It's always, it, it always has to be the Reckoner, right? It always has to be the Risen Reckoner. Get rid of the blockers. We have the Overwhelm. We're going to have a way to deal with this. Now it's a party. So we go like this. This is not going to bring back Gwen. This is going to bring back the other one. So we go Risk and Reckoner first, get rid of one blocker, have an Overwhelm, I have another Overwhelm as well on top of it. Opponent could get excited for this right now, but they still lose to this Overwhelm damage, unless they, like, they have to have get excited for one or the other, not both. We could play, uh, we, we could play Katarina here too. Ooh, but that doesn't work. We have a lot of hollows in the graveyard. This is still gonna be exactly two. This is gonna still be exactly two. And if it isn't, we have Katarina to finish up. So we just go like this. And this does bring back Gwen because now this car is getting buffed. So this is not big enough to actually bring back the Reckoner. So the problem was that if we attack with the Eternal Dancers first, it goes to poor attack and brings back the Fallen Reckoner. But by having a separate unit that attacks first, it brings back the Gwen, because Gwen only has three power. And we get to push the Gwen T2 damage. So, GG's. And lastly, you saw the power of Red Gwen. We only got to beat up on some Gens decks, so not a lot of choke is there, but the idea is very simple, right? You saw Fallen Reckoner and Risen Reckoner putting a lot of work in, in the last game against the Frelio, uh, Frelio version of the deck. And then you saw the other deck, the other one against Louis Jens, where our Gwen just puts in a lot of work as well. We didn't get to see Katarina or the Foyer kind of show off in this version, but again, you can kind of see that in my gameplay video for this deck that I posted a few days ago. Overall, all four of these decks feel really, really good if you're trying to climb ranks. Uh, my favorite is definitely gonna be Red Gwen and Kane if you really wanna climb fast. Uh, because it feels like both of these are probably the strongest one. This one is really good to climb with if, you, if you're not running into a lot of control. Uh, but if you are running into a lot of control, this is probably the weakest one into control. All the other ones tend to do really well against control. Uh, this one does better into mid-range. So it's like, what do you want to go against, right? This beats mid-range. This beats control. This is good against aggro, mid-range, and control. To be, to be honest, like, it feels like this Leona deck is kind of good against everything. Uh, and then Kane is a mix of both, right, as well. Uh, so you can kind of play around and see which one you like better. But these are the four decks. These are the four decks that I recommend 
climbing with as we approach the end of the season. Again, you only have about a week and two days. Uh, the next expansion is going to come out on December 7th. So make sure you push those last games so that you can go from silver to gold to platinum to diamond or all the way to masters. And if you reach masters or diamond or platinum, let us know in the comments below and we'll give you a shout out for anybody who reaches masters towards the end of the season. I'll, I'll give you a shout out in the next videos here. But anyways, hope you enjoyed today's showcase of all four decks. Uh, if you did, make sure to like the video below and subscribe to us. We post a lot of videos every single day. You can support us on Twitch at Twitch. So tell me we stream every now and then. And you can also find us on Discord and Twitter. The links to those are both in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you all again tomorrow.